I'm Jeroen Korthout, co-founder and CEO of Salesflare. Catch me on this week's episode of The Jesse T Show. Jeroen, welcome to The Jesse T Show, brother. Hey, glad to be here. Yeah, man. I know we're uh, in totally different different time zones and parts of the world. And, uh, you know, we plugged in and we started chatting a few months ago before the holidays. And now it's the new year. And I wanted to uh, have a convo with you and just, just kind of get people to hear your story, your journey. I think it's powerful. I think there's a lot that you could share with people. So if you could just share with the listeners and viewers a little bit about your background and who you are. Yeah. Where do I start? <laughs> First or? You go where you want, <laughs> no. brother. Um, I think... My entrepreneurial story probably started when I was about 15, 16 or something. Before that, I always liked creating stuff, you know, it, even if it was drawing or it was building camps in the woods or uh, building uh, catapults, whatever, you know, anything. It was always a lot of fun for me. But uh, the real spark for my entrepreneurial journey, I think, happened when I was in, uh, we call it secondary school here uh, in Belgium. Um we basically, my friends and I, we had we first had these GeoCities websites. I don't know whether you remember that, but it was this very easy to make, very awful little websites with uh, animations and a counter at the bottom and stuff. Um, and that sort of started sparking my imagination. Like it was, it was very limited um, and ugly, but it it was the beginning of something. And I think we are the year, uh, thinking uh, 2000, um, around, the, around the year 2000, actually. Um, and people are starting to get websites. And I started reading a bit uh, about HTML. JavaScript was something that was also uh, a bit useful, but it was mostly Flash, uh, Flash, which they just killed off. Uh, thanks to Steve Jobs and all, um, but back then it was it was still very popular. You could build all kinds of really cool animations in a pretty easy way. Um, so whole websites were built in Flash at that moment, and I uh, I got me a big book about Flash and I started reading, and I started building websites for other people, um, and I got some stuff in return. Like it's it's nothing comparable to uh, you know what what we're earning when we actually get a job. But I was 15, 16, so for me it was like, wow, making money, you know. So I saw my career um, in starting a web agency. That was my dream at that moment. Um, I also started trading um, secondhand cell phones at some point. I I bought them in Germany and I bought them in UK mostly, uh, mostly on eBay, and then I, they shipped to Belgium. Sometimes there was something wrong with it. Back then, you could still replace the cover. <laughs> that was a thing. Uh, so I would replace the cover and then sell it again in Belgium. Uh, they were also quite indestructible, these phones. That was cool. Um, and I made some money with that. And I also saw myself scaling that. You know. um, so when I um, was going to study uh, engineering, because my dad is an engineer and I was always brought up to study engineering, um, I thought about software engineering because that was the closest to my dream of starting a web agency, you know. But then I went to the open day and I figured uh, people were kind of nerdy there. Uh, they were building all this kind of stuff and showing it to me at the open day and it didn't really seem super useful and I didn't really get a connection with the people either. So in the end, uh, I didn't study computer engineering. I went for um, electronical engineering combined with business management at first and then uh, went into biomedical engineering. And then when I started applying for jobs, you know, I, I always knew I wanted to do my own thing, but I didn't have the necessary confidence to just jump uh, in it and, and do it. Um, so at first I started applying for jobs and I got all kinds of engineering jobs that never really appealed to me because I wanted to do something with people. I didn't want to sit in a back room and have someone else talk to customers and arrange stuff. I wanted to be there where the action was. And for me, that's with customers. You're creating stuff, you're offering it to customers, you're getting stuff in return, you're seeing things happen. So when I was in this interview, at some point I was at a, a 3D printing medical company before 3D printing was hip. And um, I was there for application engineer, which we sold off with customers. 
an hour really. And I told them that and they said, oh, maybe you should be a project manager then. We actually were looking for someone. Uh, you can do a test and that they did a test and they figured out that I was not a good project manager. So they said, oh, too bad. I'm going to do this for you. Uh, so I was really, really frustrated by that. Same evening, I got the credit card of a friend of mine with which we were going to go uh, out. Um, like um, I was in student city, lots of student parties. Um, and I uh, applied to do a test at business school. I got in. Um, my parents weren't really prepared for the thing, um, but I convinced them by saying that I was going to pay everything, uh, the whole studies. Um, in Belgium, usually, to give you an idea, uh, studying costs you about, I think it's closer to a thousand euros a year now, but to US standards, uh, nothing. But uh, business school was uh, 8,250. Uh, so it was kind of a, <laughs> a leap there. Um, but I ended up doing business school, which made that I could make a huge shift in my career because I didn't end up with an engineering job. I went to do marketing uh, in a pharmaceutical company. And I did that because I thought I was going to be responsible for a product, still thinking I could not start my own company yet. Uh, I, I thought I was going to have a product and I was going to be able to put that in the market and get experience from doing that. You know, it's sort of like having your own company, I thought, except it wasn't. Uh, it was the, the most, for me personally, the most depressing experience. Uh, not that it wasn't a nice company. Uh, it was Baxter, a big US pharma company. Uh, it was a, the culture was nice and all. But what I could do was so, so limited. And there was always this budget pressure, pressure from up and nobody wanted to do, do new stuff. And, you know, it was, it was, I didn't like it. Uh, so I did that for, uh, I think after six months, I was thinking of starting my own company. Um, I thought at that moment I was, I was in there in a marketing job and my marketing colleagues, they all had no experience building websites. So they will all come to me. So at some point I figured, oh, I could start back to the web agency thing for pharma companies, right? I sort of know how it works in pharma and I have all this background in, uh, in websites. So um, I went for dinner with a guy, which I didn't really understand was actually having a company that did that, but then uh, including strategy and market research and, and, and impact measurement and all this kind of stuff. Um, so he said, like, hey, you're young, um, you don't know anything, nobody's going to believe you, but I'm going to teach you everything. You join us. And within six months, you want to leave, you leave. Um, I ended up staying there for four years, but it was a great experience. Um, I was basically a consultant and account manager taking on projects from, from big companies. I would uh, go prospect. I would uh, listen what their issues were. We were an agency specialized in pharma companies, knowing much more than the other agencies, which were just generalistic agencies. So it was not too difficult to close a deal. I would make a, a proposal, a budget, sell it to them, convince them, close it, negotiate with purchasing, and then make sure that the project also got delivered. So uh, internally, uh, some project managers would take on part of the job. I would take on parts, designer, developers, you know. Um, I ended up learning a lot from that. Um, also spending time sometimes in different companies and sort of part-time jobs there. Um, so I saw a lot of cultures, did a lot of projects, got sales experience and yeah, that was really awesome, but it also wasn't what I was thinking of doing. I wanted to start my own company. Um, so at some point I went part-time there and, um, that was at the moment that I went into the founder Institute is this accelerator. And if you get in, they promise you at the end, you cannot graduate without having a company. So wow. that, that was very appealing to me because I had been sort of in that entrepreneur stage for a yep. while, like wanting to do something, but always like, ah, I wish I had a good idea, you know? <laughs> you know, that's the stage that a lot of people uh, spend in and, and just keep keep like in this uh, analysis, analysis uh, sort of phase. Um, but it was... Uh, getting into the, the, the Founder Institute, that really gave me that, that push. And I started a company. 
Um, I went part time at my job. That company was worth nothing, <laughs> and it uh, very quickly failed. But it was good. It got me started. Um, I I I understood the different parts that that go into starting a company. Um, I got my first uh, lesson, which was uh, don't start something if you don't see a business model. Uh, and um, and actually from there I I rolled from the one thing into the other. Uh, at first I started a website um, around the World Cup in Brazil, which was a dumb idea as well. Um, the idea was lots of people are going to go to Brazil. They want to do a trip around the, the World Cup um, games and they want to know how that all works. They want to book their flights, you know, and I, I made a site about how you could do all that. Uh, my wife who was uh, Brazilian. She, she gave me a lot of input and I just researched the rest myself. I got some affiliate revenues from it, which was good. Uh, because I, I basically people would would see like, oh, this is how I book flights, go to a, a place to buy flights, and I would get a good share of that. But the site died down really quickly <laughs> because, of course, after the World Cup was over, it was a useless site. Um, so it was a, not a great business. Um, I then went to a health startup weekend. Uh, this kind of startup weekends are are awesome to just get this vibe, work together with people, meet some people. Now, the thing is, we won the health startup weekend. So it was health tech startups, right? That was sort of my field. So, And um, we won it. And it was the first uh, startup weekend of its kind. So a lot of different uh, government entities and stuff in Belgium were also involved in it. And we won. So they immediately they said, oh, you should apply there and you might get money. So we did that. I wrote a, a presentation. I went to present it, and and the guy that was leading it with us, I was like the marketing head, and he was like the CEO. Uh, we sold the thing, so we got money. But then we were like a bunch of guys from a startup weekend. You know, you all have a job. You don't really know each other. It's not like there's a real like I want to work on this kind of thing. It's just like a bunch of guys together, and we had money. And yeah. It didn't go anywhere for quite a while. And at some point, my, my co-founder, who I met in the Founder Institute, he calls and he says, uh, I'm going to Vegas. Uh, he, has, he had a company by, of, of himself. And he said, I'm going to Vegas and um, I have software. It's compatible with IBM stuff. And in, in that conference, we have a booth and we just need a sales guy to join us um, to sell the, the, the software. And we did that. It was a, a great success. Uh, I would basically be the guy in, in the hallway, the corridor, sort of saying, people, telling to people like, hey, do you use uh, Kognos? And they would say, like, yes. I was like, oh, great, because we have some stuff here that complements um, Kognos. Do you know, do you like have that issue? And they would say, yes, well, we have something for that. We also have one for that issue. And they said, oh, great. And then they would ask some technical question. And then I would say, Oh, that's something, I mean, I don't know that much about it, but the guys here, they know all about it. And then I just hand them over and I would repeat that and repeat that. So there were, I was, I was in the hallway and then four guys were taking on all the leads. Um, and we had a, a, a large list of um, leads there. It was a lot of enthusiasm. So I had to start scrapping projects and I scrapped the health stick uh, startup one. Um, which at, at first seemed like a good idea, but by now I think they raised, I don't know how many millions, <laughs> 10 or so, I don't know exactly. Um, so I got out of that, but I started working with my co-founder and um, we started gearing up sales and marketing for, for that uh, business intelligence software company. And it was there actually that you know, we had this issue that this was very difficult to uh, keep ourselves organized, all the leads and stuff. Um, I had been using Salesforce in my previous job, which is like the, the, the biggest CRM in the market. I they control 20% of it or something. Uh, and that's in a market with more than 640 CRM. So uh, imagine that. But it, it doesn't really work for you as an end user, let's say. It's great for big companies. I want to have some sort of building blocks thing and consultants build the software for the company basically in Salesforce. 
But if you're a small company, it's not the kind of software that helps you sell. It's not, it's not uh, easy to use. It's not practical. It's not built for helping you sell. It's all this kind of generic screens and lots of forms and stuff. Um, and we looked for other software. Um, thankfully, there was better software, more uh, for small businesses, more directed at sales. But there was nothing that we could really like keep using. We always failed at some point. And we figured it's not really the, the software itself in terms of design or something, or it was good, but just the expectations of the software was that we would always uh, manually fill it out and put a whole lot of effort into keeping it up to date. And we figured that was not us. And it, it, it is not most people. I mean, you cannot ask someone that every time you send an email, you put it in a system, every time you have a meeting, every time you have a call, every time you even meet a new person at a company, like somebody copies in someone else in an email and then you're like, ah, I need to add that person. Or they send an email with an email signature and you're like, oh my God, stop everything. I'm going to put this in the CRM. Uh, this is his phone number, you know? Um, and we saw that actually, while a lot of that information is already in some system, it's digital, it's, it's not somehow not coming into the CRM, you somehow need to do it all manually. So we saw a big opportunity there. Uh, and that's when we started Salesforce, basically with the, the, um, the mission to make that all much simpler, to make sure that uh, people don't have to do all that manual data input. It's just a CRM that organizes it for you, helps you do your, your, your uh, sales follow-up. Um, that's uh, what we do today. Today we add, much more than that. It's not just automating the data anymore. We also make sure you can send automated emails and things. So it's it's evolving from there. Um, but it's very much around giving uh, salespeople the right tools to to be able to do their sales and and leaving the jobs that computers should do to computers. Brother, thank you so much for that 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 overview. There's there's a couple of things I want to talk about in there. Um, we'll we'll table this one, but this is something I'm personally interested in and in finding out about the CRM. Uh, end user experience and some of the uh, questions I have there because I, I've been using CRMs for years as a wealth manager and some were garbage, some that you needed to, you know, take a video to, to like l learn how to actually use it. And it was, it was really interesting. And, and I've, I've since found a really great CRM for my, for my industry, but mm -hmm. still it, it does feel like another thing to do, another task, like every little thing still has. So we'll talk about that in a second, but I want to, I want to take a step back to a little bit earlier in the conversation where you were talking about being 15, 16 years old and, you know, having this uh, entrepreneurial knack to want to start something, to want to, to do your own thing. Mm -hmm. And then that even grew from that to a few years later, where you were basically doing arbitrage, where you were buying, you know, phones for yeah. one, one amount and selling it for another amount. And this is early in the, you know, years ago before Gary V became uh, famous, if you know who he is, but Gary V is this big thought leader. I don't know. He talks about arbitrage and side hustles. And you were doing this many years ago. What, what was the inspiration? What was the uh, the muse for you? Did you have somebody in your life that you emulated that you looked up to that said, "Hey, I wanna I wanna follow this path and become an entrepreneur"? You were a entrepreneur for a while, but become yeah. an entrepreneur. How did that come about? Where you learned how to do those things, or was it just all internal knowing? And you just kind of started doing doing. It's uh, a good question. I actually, it's not. Just to give you some background, my dad is a, a sort of a hardcore engineer is uh, always led uh, research organizations, mostly at Philips, this is a big Dutch uh, electronics company. Um, his latest job was, uh, was a bit atypical. Before it was always research heavy stuff, but now he was like um, making sure that the, a, a site of Philips where things are moving to Eastern Europe mostly uh, is being filled with lots of innovative companies. So it's more of a biz dev job now, but before that was never like that. And my mom is an architect. So uh, she's been doing um, uh, churches and windmills renovation for a long while, but then she go, went into uh, apartment blocks and houses. And uh, yeah, now she's doing even a, a center for autist kids or something. I don't know exactly. Um, so entrepreneurial, they, they weren't really. Uh, maybe my mom was most entrepreneurial, like self-employed and uh, selling projects, but not really like out there or anything. So I don't know. I, I don't think I got me, my inspiration any of these places. I think it was more of um, 
I wanted to do more than that somehow. I don't know, break out of it. I also went to a quite um, strict school uh, where there wasn't a lot of um, room for um, creativity. Innovation. Uh, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was uh, It was really great teachers in the sense like, um, for instance, um, I learned French better than the French people probably because we had this teacher which would give us a book with all the, the common mistakes that people make in French. And then we would have to learn that book by heart, stuff like that. Um, so it was really drilling and we got really good at, at, at stuff. But it wasn't like a school where you learn entrepreneurship at all. <laughs> so I think it was more of a, yeah, wanting to do more than that, that, that drove me. So just kind of that, that internal intuition and that, and that, that fire that was kind of inside of you just naturally, just, you wanted to be able to kind of do your own thing and, and build something. And, um, I've seen that I've seen, even for myself, when I was a kid, I used to buy and sell and trade comic books and baseball cards. And <laughs> I would shovel snow for money in Boston. Cause there was tons of snow every year and just whatever I could kind of do to make a buck. Cause growing up, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, but I had this kind of natural hustle, but also this natural inquisitiveness. Like I wanted to learn about things. I wanted to ask questions. I was very communicative with people, sometimes to a fault where I would ask the most random questions of the most random people. But like, that was just my nature. And so yeah. I think part of it is natural. And then there's the nurture side where when you started doing these things, I was in my mind, I kept on saying he was failing forward. He was failing fast, like in, in a good way, like you would, you would go into something you would do something for six months or you would start a project and be like, you know what? This isn't serving me. This isn't what I want to do. Um, that takes some guts. That takes some balls mm -hmm. to be able to say, you know, cause there's a lot of outside pressure, especially from accomplished parents, right? Like you have parents that have had these careers and these things that they've been doing. And a lot of times people that love you will kind of dismay you from your own future and say, Hey, you know what? Like you know, just stick with this job a little bit longer, even though you hate it or just, yeah. just, just do this thing. And, and, and so did any of that come up for you where you kind of had some pushback and like the, the, the new ventures that you were trying to accomplish and people were kind of like almost naysayers in a sense. Uh, in a sense, uh, my parents are definitely, for instance, when I wanted to business school, they were like, mm. Or when I uh, when I wanted to leave Baxter, they were like, "Are you sure it's a bit not too early or something?" But it's not like they really pushed back hard. Um, they were always kind of like, "Okay, if this is what you want to do, I go for it." Um, and that's that's been really nice. It's always been uh, they've they've always let me kind of free about this kind of things, um, like having that initial pushback, but not pushing through too much. Um, naysayers yeah that i must say the most naysayers appear are when you start a company and you start going around and trying to sell it that's when you meet a lot of naysayers especially here in belgium you have no idea people are so conservative God. <laughs> i was so happy when our, our first customer was actually dutch um and we speak the same language like we speak dutch here in the, in the north of belgium it's dutch and they speak dutch it used to be one country um, but their culture is more Protestant and we're more Catholic. Uh, it's much more open. Uh, Dutch people um, sometimes uh, uh, communicate with you in a way that as a Flemish person, like North Belgium, we immediately feel insulted. They're just very like <laughs> brash. Yeah. Direct. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like people from Boston, I'd imagine. <laughs> I don't know about people from Boston. Yeah, it could be. I could tell you that's how they are. Very. They, 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 <laughs> their nickname is uh, we've been called mass holes, like Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I kind of get that vibe. It's very direct and uh, either love them or hate them, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, 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 it's nice in business in a, in a way that means well, well, we didn't sell anything in Flanders. Our first customers were in the Netherlands. Um, and then we started selling in Flanders a bit as well. But then very quickly, we started selling in the US. And that's just much more, uh, much more comfortable, I must say. It's For much sure. nicer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I live here in uh, Atlanta, Georgia now, which is much different than Boston. It's, 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 an, it's a melting pot. There's a lot of people yeah. from around the world that are here. And uh, people are just a lot more pleasant and, and easier to deal with. You know, that, that, mm. that hustle, that fast pace, that grind, that, you know, uh, 
abrasiveness that I grew up in, it's a lot, it's a lot easier to operate in a, in a place like Atlanta. So I, I kind of understand both worlds, but um, yeah. jumping, jumping back to, you know, this, this company that you built and you saw a need in the market for an intuitive, uh, just a better experience with CRM. You know, one of my first experiences, and I won't put their name out there because I don't want to disparage them in any way, but sure. it, it was awful. It was terrible. I like it made me want to go create my own thing, even though I had no clue. So like I actually started building my own like Excel thing because I like that was easier for me than learning about like video after video to do these things that should be intuitive. And then years later, I will shout these folks out because it's amazing. It's a company called Wealthbox and Wealthbox is um, geared towards financial professionals. And there's a lot of things in there that just make sense for my day to day, but still, and not throwing dirt on them, there's just some stuff that just feels like another to do, right? Like another, another task, another, you know, like you said, every time you meet someone, you have to key it in or, you know, so, so talk to the, the idea of, of what your belief was in this, the problem that you were solving and how does it actually implement into the daily life of the end user where it's making it for a better experience. And, and, and another key to that outside of the experience of that service um, you mentioned this is really important, I think, for people that are listening to this, because a lot of people have CRMs um, mm-hmm. and they use them. And so a lot of people don't use them or don't use them well. So how are you selling from the CRM? Like, what have you seen in your own personal experience as a salesperson, as an entrepreneur, the two things, the experience that makes it better through the, the your, your CRM and how to sell through that CRM? Yeah, uh, the, the second the second one is a, is a webinar of an hour I give every two weeks. So I don't know what I can share in the in the in, in this amount of time. But I'm 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 looking at Wealthbox now. Uh, it looks good. I must say it looks an awful lot like Salesforce. For, I mean, like the design is just yeah. Salesforce. It's 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 definitely got some uh, vibes of Salesforce for sure. I've used Salesforce before. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, um, yeah. We we started. I mean, when it comes to to ease of use and um, you, you can think about, okay, we're going to make an interface, which is very easy to understand uh, and uh, a small amount of clicks. That is definitely one part, but we saw a bigger issue. And the bigger issue was that the, soft, the software also requires a whole lot of work. So that's where we started. So we started with making sure that it connects to your emails. It was, we started in 2014. At the moment we did that, connecting to emails, everybody was like, are you sure? They were like, Mm, you're going to get all these emails in the CRM. Isn't it better to just only have the ones that are really important to you? And that's kind of a pushback we got at that point. Uh, since since then, a lot of CRMs have started building email integrations because Absolutely. it makes a lot of sense. Yep. Um, so we started with an email integration. We actually uh, started with building it also within Gmail and Outlook. Uh, so we made a sidebar, which made that you didn't have to work in two systems, not like, Oh, I'm in Gmail now. And now I'm in the CRM. And now I'm back in Gmail. You know, that kind of experience. The integration. We didn't want that. So at first, we didn't even build something you could open in another tab uh, because we figured like that doesn't make sense. You want to do everything from the same place. So we have it. Gmail or Outlook and the sidebar. Um, and in there, you could then very easily create accounts like companies uh, and add contacts to them, which would already be detected in your emails. Uh, and at some point people said, oh, you know, this is cool, but it doesn't really feel like a CRM because it doesn't have that full screen kind of thing. Uh, so then we have to had to build that. So we, we, we actually started with the, the sidebar and the mobile experience because it was fully integrated. And then we also built the other thing. And now you can actually decide which environment you want to be in. You could be working from Gmail with the sidebar. And at some point you could switch and say, okay, I want to work from Salesforce now. And from Salesforce, the, the same thing, you can also answer uh, emails. Uh, you can also, you know, all these kind of things. Um, so that's where we started from. It's really like completely fitting in the workflows, point one. Point two, um, making sure that as much of the work as possible is done for you. So yep. we thought really about creating an automated CRM uh, that does allow manual data inputs, but it's really automated data input first and then manual data input sort of to fix things or to add things. Um, and then we, we actually, at the beginning, when we were doing that, you know, it's not like, how can we make this as smart as possible? 
Uh, and what we often um, then did was creating something that people didn't get what it was doing. Uh, we started calling these brain farts. And we, at some point we, we, we stopped creating brain farts um, because we would, we would create something and I would show that to people and they're like, this is awesome, but what? No, I, we don't get it. We're like, but this is the most efficient way, you know? Huh? <laughs> So at some point we had to start um, really focusing on uh, making things easy to understand. The thing is, if you create online software and you don't make it easy to understand, then you're spending a whole lot of time onboarding people, like teaching them all the little things. Yes, and that's yeah. a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and it it just if people don't use things properly, then then you 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 can also not build anything. Because I mean, if they don't use the CRM the way it's supposed to be used, they won't get be getting any of the any of the benefits. Exactly. And at some point, they'll say we don't need the subscription anymore, and they leave. Yep. Uh, it's not it's not useful. And people have all right to leave if they they are not getting any uh, uh, value back. So that's already three levels: like fitting in, uh, automating as much as possible, making it easy to understand, and then and then the last part is probably. Um, trying to make it uh, a, a minimal amount of clicks, let's yep. say, yep. like making s things simple to operate. They don't spend a whole lot of software time instead of work time. Uh, so those are all four levels we, we really focus on. But we've, we focused at the beginning much more on the, the first fitting in and making sure that things are as automated as possible because we believe that's really basic to things. And that really makes that software can do stuff for you instead of you feeding software and then maybe getting some little bit of results. We make sure that this this a minimal amount of input for you, time-wise, energy-wise, and all that, uh, and a maximum amount of, of benefit you get from it. Uh, that was part one of my answer. Uh, <laughs> part two of my answer, um, when it comes to using a CRM, um, to really make more sales, um, to, to not repeat the whole webinar, I'll, 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 I'll give a few basic pieces of advice. Um, first of all, uh, choose, choose a CRM that people will use. Uh, I cannot not mention that part because uh, if you don't, then all the rest I'm going to say is going to fall apart. So a few basic things, if you, your company is in a market for a CRM, look around. Well, first, no, don't, don't start with looking around. Start with thinking what it is that you want a CRM for. Is it for uh, uh, organizing your sales process? Is it for sending uh, all kinds of automated email messages? Uh, is it for um, organizing your e-commerce shop or something? For all these different purposes, there's different CRMs. There's many different types of CRMs out there. If, if you don't know which one you're looking for, then that makes it very hard. Don't just type CRM into Google. It's gonna, uh, yeah, it's gonna sell you the wrong things. <laughs> then, uh, when you go look for something, look for something that fits. Try it yourself. See whether you you'd enjoy using it. Then, involve your team because it's not because you like using it or think you like using it that your team will like using it. And if they don't use it, you will not get any of the benefits. So make sure they they use it uh, and, and to involve them, have them use it, say, see whether they like it. I have them test drive a few. I mean, it's, it's going to, you're going to get it back the time uh, in the end because starting to use something and then stopping and having to use something else and probably taking a year to make that decision is going to cost you. Um, and then, a very essential step is also when you, everybody likes to use it and is committed and all. Um, it's important to get to know how the CRM works, obviously, but there's another level to that. When you start using a CRM as a company, it's good to uh, discuss with each other. How are you going to use it? Don't just start jamming away in it. I don't know how to say it, uh, but, but make some rules like together, like, okay, we're going to put in a company at that stage. We're going to use these uh, stages in the pipeline, like in your sales process at these moments. Uh, we're going to keep this sort of data and that extra field we created. If you do that, 
then your success will be so much bigger. Uh, like we help people with, with using the serum, understanding it, if there's issues, improving it. But we sometimes help bigger companies with, with creating this sort of guidelines to help them. Because we know that if we don't, people are not going to use it properly together as a team and it's going to fall apart at some point. Now, if you've done all these things, then you're well on the way to uh, starting to profit from a CRM. Uh, and that includes such thing as, a, as a, a, a not forgetting to follow up leads anymore and disappointing them and losing out on sales. It, uh, it means that uh, you will not have to start all over again when somebody leaves. Uh, it means that uh, marketing will not start sending promos to uh, your customers at the moment you're trying to close them because they can actually see the serum that you're trying to close them. Uh, it means that uh, finance knows what kind of money is going to come in uh, next month, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's really essential. Now, the most basic part for what, uh, for which sales like companies use the CRM is the first thing I said, sales follow-up. There's an enormous amount of lost deals every month, every year, every whatever, um, just because it slipped uh, for whatever reason. And that's very natural because um, at any point, salespeople are not just, most salespeople, it depends on the company. I, I, in my previous job, I was following up probably five leads at a time or something, which I could do in my brains. Uh, and I was selling big projects. I don't, didn't really need anything to organize myself. I had some stuff in Outlook. I was using Outlook at the time, like Outlook tasks and some stuff in Wunderlist also because I didn't really like the Outlook tasks. Um, but many salespeople that are actually really, really selling, like their job is sales, are not doing five leads. They're doing 10, 20, maybe 100, maybe hundreds. And then you cannot do that based on your brains. You need something to organize yourself. You need to set like, okay, I'm going to follow that guy. Then this is what it's about and all these kind of things. Make some notes, have a meeting, have it there. You need to have everything nicely organized. Uh, first step is getting a CRM that you're actually going to use. Make sure that the data gets in there. But then from there, it's, uh, it's all about basic tips, uh, building a sales process, that is repeatable and where every stage in your sales process uh, or sales pipeline, you know, um, represents something that you can do like an action. Like it's like, okay, uh, first step is we're going to contact them. Second step is we're going to establish whether they're interested. Second, the ne next step is uh, establishing whether we can actually sell to them. Are they qualified or not? Next step is sending them a proposal. Next step is closing them or not closing them. It, it can be more complex than this, but you need to have a very clear uh, stepwise process because basically what you do then uh, with tens or hundreds of leads at a time is always guiding them to the next step or out, uh, so, sort of up or out also. Uh, you know, if, 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 if they're not someone you can sell to, out, they're lost. If, if uh, they don't accept the proposal, well, unless you can uh, further negotiate, out. Uh, and you just, if you follow that sort of process, if it's clear for you what the next step is, then you can make it clear to the customer. Uh, so that's very important. And then uh, sometimes uh, flush that pipeline is very essential as well, because otherwise you will lose control. Uh, at some point it clogs with all kinds of old stuff that you're never going to close anymore. Yep. Uh, so sometimes just remove all the old stuff. Um, and... Um, what else is important is setting reminders for yourself. Our system does auto reminders, but it's it's good for yourself. Every time somebody says next week, you say next week, and you follow up next week, and they'll be impressed. They're like, oh my god, he's there again. How does he do that? Um, that's really really the basics. Uh, and apart from that, in sales, just listen to your customer. So it really helps before you start launching that PowerPoint presentation or running right through. You know. <laughs> two ears, one mouth, right? You get two ears to listen more than yeah. you should be speaking, especially in sales. A lot of sales people, when they first start out, they just want to, they want to get their pitch out. They just want to, yeah. you know, but it's always about listening and finding the pain points and being able to be empathetic and relate 
and and be able to deliver a solution that matters that, that that's uh, powerful. So that's someone funny. as someone who's been in I've been in sales in one way, shape, or form pretty much my whole life, but professional sales for like the last fifteen years, and you know there's a lot of need to keep alignment with what's going on from you know initial contact, prospect, follow up, all the way through to close 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 deal, and then from close deal the relationship still has so much more from there. It could be a lifelong relationship. The way I look at my clients is a client family. So anytime I bring somebody intentionally into my business, I look at look, working with them for life. And so there's an ongoing follow-up. There's an ongoing uh, you know, touch frequency in terms of the things that I'm connecting them you know, on, whether it's a, a semi-annual review, whether it's you know tax preparation with their financial planning, whatever it is, there's always a cadence and a rhythm. So my question is, there's these uh, statistics, and we all know statistics can be made to show whatever they want, but um, the statistics in sales say that it takes eight to 12 touches on average to close a deal. That could be a phone call, that could be an email, that could be a text, that could be whatever it is. A, you being in sales personally through the years, have you seen something similar to be true where it takes multiple contacts? And B, how have you seen it work inside of a CRM where you can set up those contacts, you know, what they call in the financial planning world, which is kind of silly, but they call it like a drip campaign where you just constantly, you know, kind of build up. It's like, you know, add value, add value, add value, maybe ask for the deal kind of thing. Like what are some experiences you've had that you've seen that, that that's worked for you? Yeah. Uh, first of all, these stats that everybody's sharing, once I wanted to use them in a presentation and I did a lot of digging to find out where they come from. Uh, they're totally made up. Of course they, uh, <laughs> they say 75% of stats are, are, are made up. Like it's like, like the joke within the joke. Like it's just made to see whatever you got to say, you know? Yeah. But, but, but in the end, I, I did use them in my presentation at the bottom. I said something like they're made up, but it's still they're true. Um, because yes, I mean, uh, a lot of uh, sales are made after a while, after following up a lot. Um, so that's really essential that you organize yourself for that follow-up. Uh, when you start talking about drip campaigns, I sort of get a bit the, whew. yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't recommend those per se. Um, what works is automating things, for instance, as long as you, you don't get in touch with someone, but you need to do it in a, in a empathetic way like thinking like what's the the guy what's going to trigger the person on the other end yep uh how can i do the best to uh, adjust to them um to make sure that i'm going to respect their time and all, and all that um that it's not a huge barrier for them to engage with me um and what works then is sending out sort of sequences um so if you're reaching out to people you send a first email where you sort of have a generalistic hook and you ask like, um, is this, is this something to talk with you about or someone else in your company, which is, which is usually a good way of going about it because, uh, it's very low. It's not like, let's get on a call. People are like, yeah, I don't want to get on a call. It's more like, is it, is it you or someone else? And they'll, they'll say like, yeah, it's me. And if it's, if it's them, great. If it's someone else, uh, They'll, they'll send the email on and you'll be in touch. And it's great, especially when you email the CEO because the other person needs to pick it up. Then subsequent emails, I usually sort of create the same theme, but it depends on what you're actually prospecting for, like how you're going to approach it. Um, like if you know that they probably didn't reply to the first one because I had a certain objection and maybe you want to tackle that objection in the next one. Don't do it in the first one immediately. Well, you could, but maybe there's a second objection you want to tackle that in the, in the second one and, and sort of um, rephrase the thing in a different way. Don't just send, hey, I didn't hear you yet or something that's, that's dumb or <laughs> any news or, you know. Right. Um, kind of comes off and, a little bit desperate. Yeah, and, and like you're just jamming away at emails without thinking about other people's feelings. Um, sequences of about four emails are probably good. Um, after four emails, you've usually... Ooh. Yep, you got a little blurriness going on there. I think we got you. Let's, let's see. There we go. Oh, yeah. We go. 
Uh, after four emails, you probably uh, you mostly don't get a lot of extra responses anymore. Uh, most responses are on the first one, some less on the second one, third, fourth. Um, I think when we do sequences, for instance, we get about half of the responses on the first email. Um, but the second, third, and fourth together still add the other half. Yeah. Uh, where we then often have reply rates around, I think they're usually around 45%. Okay. Um, but the first email gets like 23% or something. So it makes a lot of sense to, to retry a few times. What's, what's uh, your, um, time frame in between, let's just that illustration you gave us with the four email sequence. What's the time frame between email one, two, three, and four, how much time lapses between each one? The, f- the first one's a bit closer together, like three, four days. Uh, unless it's weekends, you need okay. to avoid weekends. Um, and then, uh, and then as it goes a, a, a bit more time, so you're Got not it. annoying people too much. Yep. Um, and what did I want to say more about that? Yeah. Then there's, you, you can do this kind of, it's another way of, of, of keeping a relationship going is, um, if it's at scale, you can add them to some sort of, um, a newsletter thing where you, you you send them value or um what we do also is inviting people to webinars and all that but make sure that it's, if you invite them it's actually something useful for them for yes. that you need to um organize your data well so that for instance uh, if we launch a new feature uh, permissions we don't start uh, selling this to people who are just uh two on the team they probably don't need permissions <laughs> Uh, we uh, like five users and up. Yes, they're, they're probably good for it. Um, and next to that, what I like to do as well is if you're like trying to convince people of doing something, that you keep a conversation going about different topics. That you sometimes also help people with something, and at some point you might get the thing you're trying to uh, get. Uh, it might take a while. It might take uh, years of conversation perhaps, uh, but it's good to just keep some relationship going. It's beautiful, brother. There's lots of uh, amazing golden, golden nuggets for people in here to listen to and uh, kind of restructure and reframe their paradigm thinking on you know how they prospect and how they follow up and how they sell. And I think that if people just kind of get in tune with a, their intuition, but also have a system that helps them not remember everything. And then the, the biggest thing is, like you said, being empathetic and being mindful of the end user or the person they're selling to, because at the end of the day, it's a relationship. It might be a business relationship, sales process, but at the end of the day, it's another human being on the other end of that, that transaction. And, and that's actually what's going to make the difference between you and other people. Uh, and I'm saying you and other people, because if you actually act on this, it's, it's you and other people. Most people automate stuff without thinking much about what people on the other end are going to think. Just blast which it out an- crap. Which annoys everyone. Yep. Everybody knows what they get in their mailboxes on a daily basis. It goes to junk. Is- it goes to a junk. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's immediately like, like you, you lose credibility and you lose impact and power when you just spray people with crap. Yeah. But on the other hand, the flip side is that uh, there's so much crap out there. When I get a good email, somebody who actually cares, I'm like, oh, a nice one. Yep. And yep. Uh, it impacts and, you. Yeah. So so just just try to be that nice email, and uh, it you you will yeah it will make a huge difference. Big difference. Um, I want I want to pivot real quick and talk about the economy uh, where you're at in Belgium in terms of you know business and growing a company during the middle of a, a worldwide pandemic. How has the pandemic, the coronavirus, affected? you and your business and then the economy surrounding you. Uh, yeah, so so that, that's really uh, double because uh, we are not at all impacted by our local economy. Uh, the only way in which you're impacted is that it's easier for us to get loans and stuff like that sure. now. Uh, yeah. They're backed by the, the by the European government. Uh, well, indirectly at least. But um, we sell worldwide, um, mostly in the US, but then all over Europe, um, all over the world, actually, in, in 60, 70 countries. Um, and we've only indirectly been impacted because we sell, um, to, we sell to companies who sell to other companies. Yep. So we're, we're not selling through uh, restaurants or you know, 
all kinds of stuff that is impacted is usually not B2B companies, although they might be impacted because, for instance, uh, they are a caterer or uh, they're a travel tech company or, you know, we, we, we have some of, or uh, one of our, uh, our customer we closed right before Corona came around was a, an events agency, a huge one. Um, they've, they've had a bit of um, more difficult times, but sure. I mean, they're pivoting, they're doing online events and all that now. Um, so we didn't have a whole lot of impact ourselves around us here. Yeah. I'm, I'm here at home next to us is a restaurant. Uh, that restaurant has been closed from March to May or June. Then it reopened a bit for the summer and then it's closed since half of October. Uh, the guy is really trying to be creative about keeping his business up. Uh, in the spring, he was he was selling pizzas here on the terrace. It's a chic restaurant. It's not, it's not like a place that sells pizzas. But, you know, he was selling pizzas. He was selling all kinds of boxes for Mother's Day, for Father's Day. Yeah. For, you know, I don't know what. <laughs> Take away, support local business, all this kind of stuff. Um, but right now, he's not he's not doing anything. I think he, he thinks it's uh, at this moment, it's just better to do nothing and then and uh, just take a bit of uh, support from the government and hope to soon open his business again. How is the support from the government where you are uh, in terms of, uh, you know, in the U.S., they do PPP loans, economic disaster loans. They have some small stimulus, you know, for families and stuff like that, which the stimulus for families is, is next to nothing. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it, it is a few hundred bucks here and there. Some you know, my family qualified for like the max amount because of kids and different stuff. And, but the PPP loans are basically uh, payroll protection program loans where um, they want to keep employees, you know, in, in hired essentially. And so be, if you could show that your company runs payroll, they'll give you pretty much a forgivable loan to be able to keep mm-hmm. your business running. Are there similar programs in place or, or, or a lot? Cause the side piece of that question is, here in the U.S., a lot of businesses are going under either way. So are, are, is that kind of similar over there? Uh, first of all, we don't have the stimulus for families. Um, here, everything is on a, a company level. And companies, uh, when they're closed, they get, they get money. They don't only get loans. They just get a, a sort of payment. I don't know how it's calculated. In the beginning, it was super easy. I think you got a a 4,000 euros in the first lockdown or something if you had to close, but now they're, they're really calculating the things. I don't sure. know how it works because yep. we're not, we're not taking it. So um, next to that, they give out a lot of loans as well. Uh, basically, if your company was doing well before it all began, uh, then you can get a loan and it's all backed by the government. So the bank doesn't back it. Uh, it's, it's fully the government. Banks are in charge of uh, distributing the loans yep. and doing all the checks and stuff, but it's it's way easier to get a loan because a lot of people just need it. Um, and next to that, there's some other um, some other ways. It's all all government backed stuff, but again, all on company level, nothing on on family level because that that's supposed to trickle down. And people can also take um, like if a company doesn't doesn't need you because it's not functioning then there is some uh, rules around then you go on um, a sort of temporary unemployment or something that in which you get paid quite well uh, so that's the way to support families you could say got it okay and how's the lo- are you are you fully locked down again currently right now uh they don't call it fully but yeah let's say it's fully, fully. so so to give you an idea um um, shops are mostly open, but you can only go with one person at a time, not with your family. Um, you need to wear a mask in all of the shops, obviously. Uh, you can only see um, one person outside of your family in your house. And if you go walking outside, you can be four adults uh, together. Uh, kids right now they still don't have rules about so you can have as many kids as you like although i think they they switched them now kids are also involved or something i don't know exactly people are all confused they always keep changing rules (laughs) um restaurants and bars are still closed hairdressers are reopening uh, just in a few weeks i think and and nail salons 
Um, but yeah, we were hoping to have uh, everybody vaccinated by summer. Summer's the goal. Okay. Yeah. Are you, is it, is it one of those things where it's, uh, I don't want to say forced, but is it, is it, is it highly recommended that everyone's getting vaccinated or can people still choose not to? You can choose not to. It's, it's highly recommended. And, uh, for everyone listening, I would highly recommend it to you. Uh, I'm personally, I, uh, my first job at Baxter, what I was selling was vaccines. Um, I got uh, a lot of training when I was at Baxter about vaccines. I can, uh, tell you all, there's nothing bad in vaccines. The one of Pfizer is maybe slightly risky because they've never really done mRNA at this scale. Um, but by the time most listeners will get vaccinated, a lot of people will have been vaccinated before you. And you will see that I am assuming that, that most people will not have had um, uh, side effects. Some might have, and you might see some videos on the internet to try to scare people, <laughs> but it's, it's really, it's really uh, uh, generally safe, much safer than most of the other drugs you're probably taking. A hundred percent. I feel uh, there's, there's a resurgence. Uh, this is a conversation for another time, but there's, there's, there's uh, natural plant medicine type stuff that's in the world right now. That's really helping um, disrupt big pharma. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. So as long as that's, that's uh, if, if you're talking about uh, it, eating a whole food plant-based diet, then for sure uh, go for it. Yeah. I mean, you know, health, health uh, starts in the gut and, and, and keeping yourself, um, you know, well-rested nutrition, uh, you know, working out, moving, you know, community, being around people that you love. Like these are all things that keep us well, getting 15 to 20 minutes of sun every day. And, and the master, you know, we have uh, vitamin D, which almost acts as a hormone. Like this is a whole conversation. Yeah. I'm, I'm big into biohacking. So we could talk part two, but then also plant medicines that like, uh, I don't know if you've seen the work they're doing with like psilocybin or MDMA over at MAPS, MAPS in California. And even John Hop Johns Hopkins put out a, 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 a paper saying that um, psilocybin therapy is four times more effective than any antidepressants that are on the market. So I, I, mm. I think we're coming into this beautiful time period where there's a renaissance, a resurgence of these natural gifts that we've been given. So all that to say, if people want to get the vaccine, get the vaccine. If people want to keep their personal sovereignty and not be told what to do, I'm, I'm down with that too. So um, yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe a book recommendation as we're talking about this. Uh, the book of, of Dr. Gregor, How Not to Die, is a really great book. It's a it's about uh, what you should eat if you don't want to die quickly. Basically, <laughs> most of the American diet is shit. It's awful. Uh, That's why yeah. like to like two thirds of us are, are fat. But it's it's not very difficult to change. No, uh, just read the book and you will be convinced. Another great book about sleep is uh, Matthew Walker, Why We Sleep. It will convince you to uh, start sleeping. <laughs> and uh, maybe if you're into longevity, a really great book also is it's behind me here. Uh, David Sinclair, uh, Lifespan. Um, three book recommendations for you for free. I'm gonna, I love that. No, 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 no charge. So uh, I'm going to get you plugged into a couple people uh, for you because I know you're into this world, obviously, with what you just recommended. But there's a guy, Ben Greenfield. Have you heard of him yet? No, he's amazing. Uh, he's, he's this term biohacker, but basically he's using modalities and protocols to be able to, uh, reverse his aging, uh, in a sense yeah. he, he's 38, 39, his telomeres were 38, 39. And after X amount of time, he's been able to reduce that by about half. And so he's doing all these things. And another guy is Paul check and Paul check is kind of like the godfather of all this David, David Asprey, all these guys, but I'll get you plugged in uh, as we jump off. But sounds good. You've been amazing. I have the, I have the book here of Ben Greenfield here already. Anyway, yeah, Ben Greenfield. There's a couple books um, that he's really amazing. I'm boundless here. Boundless is great. And then the other one before it with the heart on there. What's that one called? Beyond Training. That one's really good too. Yeah. Uh, but that that's a amazing human being to follow and to link up with. But you're an amazing human being that people should follow and link up with you. So we'll make sure that all your stuff is in the show notes, all the ways to connect with you, you know, websites and social media. But uh, we want to say thank you so much for being on the show today. He's the amazing, the mighty, the powerful, Jeroen Courthout. I'm Jesse T. Be sure to catch us on next week's episode of The Jesse T Show.